Uh, great. Uh, well, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, uh, we're here in Green Hall on the University of Minnesota St. Paul campus uh, with John Carlson. Um, John's with the Minnesota DNR Forestry and he's going to talk to us today about uh, the Sustainable Forest uh, Incentive Act um, and some of the new changes uh, that have been going underway. We know there's a lot of interest in this topic uh, and really uh, glad that all of you have joined us online or joined us here um, in St. Paul. Um, just a couple of updates um, kind of about the WebEx system. Um, if you have questions for John uh, as he goes through his presentation, uh, we encourage you to ask them. Uh, so there are two ways you can ask them. Um, either through the chat box, which you should see in the lower right corner uh, on the WebEx system, or in the Q&A box. Um, either one will work for us. Um, if you do send questions, be sure to send them to all panelists. So send your questions to all panelists and we'll get them uh, and we'll relay them to John um, here in St. Paul. Um, just upcoming uh, next month's webinar um, is on um, the forest fires um, um, and the seasonal timing of fire and its influence on ecological succession. Um, and so that webinar is on February 20th. Um, again, I think that's the third Tuesday uh, in the month of February. So um, other than that, um, I don't have anything else. Uh, if you do have any issues, uh, feel free to type uh, in the chat area with your questions or, or anything else. Uh, related to the webinar, uh, but other than that, I'll hand it over to John. Great, thank you, Matt. Um, yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to come here and talk today about the changes in the SFI program. I hope everyone's warm today, has a good excuse to sit down and, and watch a webinar here. And I've been informed, I'm already getting questions on the Vikings game coming up next Sunday. And unfortunately, I'm not going to have the answers to that. So, but uh, the goal is to have some answers on some of the changes to the SFI program. There was a letter that went out this last January to all current enrollees. And if you were a plan writer, you should have received a copy of that letter from myself. Um, so that kind of, that spurred a lot of questions. And I tried to structure this talk a little bit to address some of those uh, concerns that came up. But I'm going to, I'll, going to run through uh, much of the law here. Um, just a quick background on myself. So I've been with the Division of Forestry since 2001. And for about 15 years, I was a forester working uh, with private landowners and on state land. And so it was about two and a half years ago now, I took this job as the, the private forest management coordinator for DNR Forestry and also currently the, the SFI coordinator duties as well. So with that, we'll get moving here. Um, there we go. So I'm going to talk for about 40 minutes and then we'll leave about 20 minutes for questions. So um, if you have, I'll pause at one point about 20 minutes through um, for, for a question or two, but otherwise um, we'll, we'll run through most of them towards uh, the end of the webinar here. So first I'm going to give you a, a background of SFIA and kind of the purpose of the, of the law and to provide some context for the rest of the discussion. And then I'm going to go into I kind of changed the structure the last minute. Instead of going right into the general changes, I wanted to highlight three of them that have been generating some questions from this last uh, letter that went out to current enrollees, and that's going to be conservation easements and public access, forest management plan registration, and covenants. So I'll run through those three, and then we're going to go over the rest of the changes and touch on some dates. We'll, we'll talk about how it affects you if you're a current enrollee, if you're a new enrollee, or, or a uh, plan writers or service provider moving forward and then again we'll have time for questions so with that I got a fair amount of slides to go through and um, I'm sure there's going to be some questions so so what is SFIA well SFIA stands for the Sustainable Forest Incentive Act and so it's administered by the Department of Revenue and it was enacted in 2001 and it replaced the forest taxation law dating from 1957 um, don't know the details of that law, um, but that was it, it did replace that back in 2001. And currently, there's about 2,900 enrollees for a little over a million acres. You can see that uh, the program uh, touches a lot of people across the state. So now let's kind of go into the the why. Why you know why why do we have this program? Um, and the reason is is because our private forests of Minnesota continue to provide public benefits to all Minnesotans. And we know what those are, you know, that could be clean water, it could be, you know, carbon sequestration, clean air, provides wildlife habitat, 
uh, provides better recreational opportunities, whether it be fishing, whether it be hunting. And it also, you know, it provides, um, it supports a, a robust force of products economy in northern Minnesota, which is a, you know, a very important benefit as well. So that's why, you know, and luckily the state legislature has recognized this. Um, and so that's kind of goes back to, to why they created this law to, to, help, to help our private forest lands. And so what is the purpose? There's two purposes of this law. And one of them is to encourage sustainable forest management on private forest land. And the other is to keep forest land as forest. So our private lands are under increasing amount of threats such as development and conversion. So if we can protect those forest lands from doing that, um, all Minnesotans um, will win. So there's two, um, two ways that um, those, two, the perp those two purposes are met. And that is by getting that forest management plan so that, that's your, your avenue to practicing good forest management, you know, good forest stewardship on your land. We call it kind of the great door opener. You get a, a forest management plan, uh, you meet a professional forester and all those opportunities are presented to you. And then the covenant, and we'll talk about what more of a covenants are, that's the restriction that's replaced on your land for development. And so that is the tool for keeping forest lands as forest. So if we move forward now, how is that done? So the state of Minnesota pays the landowner an incentive payment, and I underline incentive because it's not a tax program. Um, it's not a tax reduction like 2C managed forest land. It's actual, it's an incentive program. So it's, an, it's a payment, $7 per acre is what it was this last year. If you get this forest management plan and you record a covenant restricting development, and you have to agree to do that for a minimum of eight years. So I just kind of wanted to lay, lay that out for you to, it's a good reminder in why this law is here. Um, sometimes we kind of get caught up on the, the nuts and bolts of some of the logistical issues with it. So if you keep the purpose in mind of the law, it kind of will help you know, provide context as um, and help understand why the law is, is administered as it is. Real quick, the eligibility requirements. I could spend quite a bit of time on some of these, but I'm just going to buzz through them real quick in case you're not familiar with elig eligibility. You have to have 20 contiguous acres of land. Um, 50 of it has to be, meet the definition of forest land, so it has to be half forested. You have to have a current forest management plan that has been approved, um, written by a, an approved DNR plan writer, so that's always been in the law. The only difference is now it's going to be, it has to be registered, and I'll explain that coming up here. Can't have delinquent property taxes, so that's, that's eligibility requirements. And once you're in, the land has to be enrolled for a minimum of eight years your forest management plan must be implemented. And if you do a timber harvest, you must follow uh, the forest management uh, harvest guidelines uh, produced by the Minnesota Forest Resource Council. You also must allow public access if, if enrolling over 1,920 acres. So again, all these have been in the law already, so none of this is new, but I just want to touch on this real quick um, for those that, that are unfamiliar with it. So brief history now. So in 2013, the Office of Legislative Auditor released a report. They audited the SFIA program. And so they came up, they, they found some issues and they came up with some suggestions on how the law could be changed to better meet its purpose and, and benefit uh, Minnesota private forest land. And so in 2014, there was some new language that was introduced in the legislative session that year. And in 15 and 16, that language got incorporated uh, into the tax bill. So SFI is a part of the tax bill and there was strong support for these changes. However, being it was a part of the tax bill, the tax bill wasn't passing. So then therefore SFI did not pass. Well, lo and behold, last year in 2017, the, the tax bill passed. So therefore the, S the new SFI changes passed. So, um, and so here we are today. So, um, we have a new SFIA law, and that's uh, Chapter 290C. And actually online, I went to their website here, and if you want to go read the law yourself, uh, if you get this uh, PowerPoint at a later date, you can click on the link, or just Google MNSFIA 290C, and you'll be able to find that. It says Sustainable Forest Resource Management Incentive, and so I wrote it just how it says it on there. So don't be confused if that's what it says. It doesn't say Sustainable Forest Incentive Program. Um, so some of these changes were effective immediately, which was earlier in 2017. 
Most of the changes went effect here on January 1st of this year. And an important point that I'll keep bringing up today um, is current enrollees have until July 1st of 2019 to fully meet these new requirements. So the, they, they allowed, they call the transition provision to allow time for current enrollees to, to get up to the standard of the new requirements. And then also for the administering agencies, Department of Revenue and now DNR, to be able to, to, to come up with a way to administer the new law. So um, that's called the transition provision. And so I'll, as I talk, I'll kind of break out current enrollees versus new enrollees, because some things only affect current enrollees and would not affect new enrollees. So I'm um, going right into uh, one of the, the new requirements in the law and what's generated some questions is conservation easements and public access. So what this new requirement is, is landowners with less than 1,920 acres. And the, the, where that number comes in is because if you're over that, you have to allow public access. And that's already been a part of the law um, last year. If, if you have a conservation easement that's less, or I'm sorry, let me start over. If you have SFIA land that is less than 1,920 acres, which is most of you, and you have a conservation easement that overlaps your SFIA land, you will now have to allow public access. So we don't anticipate this affecting a lot of people. The vast majority of enrollees are not going to be in this situation. But we had to put this in a letter because we do not know who has conservation easements out there. And so if this does affect you, um, you, have a, you would have to now allow public access. And because that is a brand new requirement that you didn't sign up for, you have the option to withdraw that from SFIA. The effect, you can only withdraw the affected land only. So again, the land where the easement overlaps with SFIA, you could enroll that and you have to notify Department of Revenue by July 1st of this year. So I'll, go, I'll talk a little bit more now how you know, how, how might you know if, if that does apply to you? So first let's back up and we're gonna define what a conservation easement is. So again, I wanna reiterate SFIA is not a conservation easement. There's some similarities, but the way this law is written, when, it's, when it talks about conservation easement, um, it's not referring to SFIA as a conservation easement, because if it did, then that would affect pretty much everybody. So cons I'll just read it off here. A conservation easement is a voluntary legal agreement between a landowner and another person or organization. That would be the easement holder. Um, and essentially, you, you'll agree on a, a set of um, restrictions to conserve the natural and scenic benefits of that land, whatever it may be. So it's uh, the landowner negotiates that with the agency and it takes time to do. There's a lot of paperwork involved. So you're not, it's not as, as simple as you received a, a letter in the mail and you checked that you want to have a conservation easement. This is a, is a quite lengthy process in order to set one of these up. And I just mentioned that if you're wondering if you have one, um, that if, if it was put on the land um, while you owned it, you would definitely know about it. You should know about it. And so who are some of the common easement holders? So they're the ones that, that that set up the easement. So Minnesota DNR is obviously a big one. And some of the easement programs um, around the state are like Forest Legacy, Forest for the Future, Trout Stream, Native Prairie Bank, Wild and Scenic River, Army Compatible Use Buffer, or ACUB, that's around Camp Ripley. Uh, Minnesota Land Trust is the largest nonprofit organization that holds conservation easements. Uh, Board of Soil and Water Resources, Bowser, holds a lot of conservation easements. And the Soil and Water Conservation Districts, the SWCDs, a lot of times are the ones that do the work on the ground with that. Ducks Unlimited, Nature Conservancy, Pheasants Forever. So I just wanted, wanted to mention these so um, to help provide some context to be able to answer the question, do you have a conservation easement on your land? And if you are unsure, and so uh, before I say that, uh, so conservation easement, it's recorded. It is recorded on on the land and it stays with that land most often forever um, so that means in, in uh, i can't in, <laughs> i can't say the word right now uh, but it stays with your land forever so uh, so if you do have that it's going to show up on the title regardless of the owner so in order to find that out if you're still unsure you can contact the county recorder's office and in, in the county where your land is located in 
and you can ask them if there's a conservation easement on the land and they should be able to help you um, figure that out so there's some more information i put down on this and so and i'll reference our web page again but definitely go to the dnr sfi web page if you're still unsure and you maybe have more questions on conservation easements or google mndnr sfia so hopefully that that helps um, those of you that have questions on that so now the next uh, big question we have with the changes are is uh, forest management plans and plan registration so a new requirement is that you have to register your plan with the dnr so what does that mean and what is a forest management plan so current enrollees you must submit a full plan to the dnr for registration by may 15th of 2019 and that's if it's not already registered some of you might have registered your plan already some of you may be thinking too well did not didn't i already submit a copy of my plan to the department of revenue to get into the program and at the time so revenue the only thing they asked for was the cover page of the plan and the map and so all enrollees should have already submitted the cover page and a map um, so the difference here with registration is we need to see a full copy of the plan and i'll talk a little bit about what you know what that looks like um, and, and what that means and so we're going to waive there's a registration fee so that fee is going to be waived if you're a current enrollee um, and what would happen if you didn't register your plan by the deadline of 2019 you would still be uh, bound by the covenant but you would miss your payment for that year um, so you'll definitely want to um, to locate that plan if you're unable to so some of you might be asking what is a forest management plan so in a nutshell forest management plan describes your land vegetation and gives recommendations to improve it based on your goals for your property and they're usually prepared by a professional forester and in minnesota here if you were an sfia before it should have been approved or written by a, a forester who's approved by dnr to write plans so uh, in DNR, we already have a standard for, for management plans, and that's called the Woodland Stewardship Plan. So that's going to be the most common format that it would take. And that's a federal program, and we already have a system in place to, to offer that product to landowners. So in all likelihood, that is, is, is the plan you would have received for your property. And typically, they're about 10, 10 to 30 pages in length, and that can vary based on, on how the size of your land. And they need to be updated every 10 years to be eligible for SFIA. 10 years is a, is a national standard um, that the US Forest Service who administers the, the forest stewardship plan um, nationwide that pushes it out to states. 10 years is their recommendation for a life of a plan. So we follow that recommendation. So that's where the 10 years comes in. So if you're wondering still, what is that plan? What does it look like? Here's a picture of it. it's usually in a large three ring binder and on the cover it'll say woodland stewardship plan and the picture might be different from this one but um, essentially this is is what it would look like and it'll, there'll be a lot of reference material in there there'll be a large stack of information but there's another black booklet in there some reference information and on the left here you'll see this is just an example of what your cover page might look like It'll identify you, it'll identify how many acres and where your land is. It will also, it might talk about how many acres are your property is, how much we're stewardship acres, and how much we're eligible for 2C or SFIA. And then it will have your plan preparer's name on it and then your goals. So and this is usually in the front of that binder. So if, if you're having a hard time finding your plan, look for that binder and open it up and you should see your plan. This one in particular doesn't have a lot of the information filled in, but it should give you an idea so the next question is so now we know what a management plan is or a better idea what a management plan is so what does it mean to register your plan with the dnr so when a plan is registered actually an actual dnr forester will review that plan to make sure that it's eligible for sfia and also to check to see that that plan meets federal standards and also state standards so remember I said that this is a, the forest, the Woodland Stewardship Plan is a, is a byproduct of a federal program called the Forest Stewardship Program. So they have some guidelines and a framework that, um, 
they want us to abide by. So that's that's the uh, the ground framework. And then we also have some state standards that we put on top of that. So the only way we can assure that these plans are meeting that standard is to uh, DNR Forces will actually review the plan. And typically, uh, uh, the, the plan writer sends the plan to the DNR Forester, and that plan will get reviewed and registered before the landowner. Let me back up. It won't actually be registered yet, but the, the review process goes back and forth between the plan writer and the DNR Forester before the landowner actually gets the plan. So plan writers, this, this is a process that's already been in place um, here in the state, and so it's uh, it, it's just a way to, to, to make sure these, these plans are meeting a certain standard. And then we have to take a copy of the plan. Um, you would then be, we, we have your information, and then you can receive um, notifications when your plan's gonna expire, you know, when that plan will need an update again. So that's another benefit. Um, and like I was saying, so it's been around for a while, and it, and it first became a requirement um, for 2C managed forest land. So that laws, that's been written in law since 2C has been in place, that you have to register your plan with DNR Forestry. And so this process has already been in place. And so now SFI is following up and, and taking the same requirement where you have to register that plan. And there is a $50 fee to register. Um, so th that's standard. Now, if you are a current enrollee, as I said before, we're waiving that fee um, during this transition. But all new enrollees and anyone uh, registering a plan for 2C or another reason, then there's, there's a typically that $50 registration fee. And previously, registration, you know, years ago was voluntary. So some of you may have voluntarily registered your plan with the DNR, and you may not even know it. Um, and you would have received a verification letter in the mail from DNR saying, we received your plan, your plan registration, your plan is now registered. You would have been issued a, a registration number. So if, you know, that's, if you can check your records, if you have that letter and it's registered and that plan is within 10 years, chances are your plan is registered. However, it'd be a good idea um, for you to check with us and I'll, and I'll mention how to do that. So if your plan is not registered, and I'm gonna go in a little bit more detail on this, on this later, but I'm just gonna mention it right now quickly, is you send an email of your plan to uh, this uh, email address as you see on there. And if you don't have an electronic copy, I'll tell you in a little bit how, to, how you may be able to get that or you can also mail a copy to the DNR address. So there's more information in that, in that letter you receive if you're a current enrollee, and there's more information on our website that goes into more detail on some of this. So that's forest management plans and registration. And now I'm just gonna quickly touch on covenants. So what is a covenant, all right? So a covenant is a set of obligations or requirements that are placed on your land. So in that, in that state, it's a legal document that's recorded at the county recorder's office and it stays with your land regardless of ownership. And again, that's that purpose of keeping forest land is forest. This is the mechanism to do that is the covenant. An important point I wanted to mention here, which is a, is a common um, point of confusion or uh, misunderstanding is, is that covenants do not expire, but forest management plans do. So what does that mean? Yeah. A lot of people would assume that when your forest management plan expires in 10 years, that you're, you're free to get out of SFIA, you're no longer in the program if you choose not to update your plan. However, like I was saying, a covenant is bound with your land um, forever. Actually, I didn't say that yet, but that, that is, so a covenant stay with your land forever until the Department of Revenue releases your covenant. And it doesn't automatically expire after eight years. Eight years is the minimum. So I'll talk a little bit more about this, but, but I just wanted to bring up that point is covenants do not expire, forest management plans do. So like I was saying, to release that covenant, revenue has to do that for you. And the only way for that to happen is you have to submit a written request to the Department of Revenue. And the only time it can come out is if you first have to meet that minimum covenant length requirement of eight years. And then it takes four years. So after this request, it takes half of that covenant length to release it before you withdraw from SFIA. So for example, for an eight-year covenant, which has been the standard only option up to, to last year, it takes four years to complete the withdrawal, to meet that withdrawal requirement. So for example, again, if you wanted to withdraw at year 12, 
you would have to provide written requests to the Department of Revenue at year eight so that that four year clock can start ticking now. So that's kind of, uh, so I provide a little background. I hit on registration force management plans, covenants, and, and easements and public access. And then I'm gonna go into the rest of some of the changes. So this might be a opportunity to pause for a question or two if, if we feel it's necessary. Otherwise I can keep on. I don't see anything from our online audience right now. Okay, great. Can I ask a quick question? So yeah. After this, let's say the 12 year period, is there a fee or penalty or are you, after 12 years you can get out and not be, not pay a penalty? There, yeah, there's no penalty. Um, can you repeat the question, John? Okay, so the, the question is, is after 12, in this example I gave, after 12 years, so if you put a request to withdraw at year eight, would there be any penalty of you leaving the program? No, there is no penalty. So um, you met the obligations of the program. You met it for at least a minimum of eight years. You put in the proper request. And so at year 12, um, you would be released from the, um, the restrictions of the covenant and payments would stop. Um, for your land, and yeah, you'd be free to do whatever you wanted to do, basically. Okay, so essentially I highlighted some of the changes, so now I'm going to go over um, the rest of the changes. Um, and one of the big ones is, is now that it is jointly administered by Department of Revenue and Minnesota DNR Forestry. And that is new. So previously it was only Department of Revenue. And so now Department of Revenue um, so their duties, and they're going to continue to handle landowner eligibility. They'll handle payments, applications, penalties, um, if you're looking to withdraw. So Department of Revenue is going to continue to administer that portion, and it'll be real similar to how it has been in the past. And DNR, um, our new uh, role now is going to be to determine land eligibility. So if you're wondering, you know, how many acres are eligible? You know, so we'd be able to help you with that. And then specifically where this would come in is, is requiring that Woodland Stewardship Plan or Forest Management Plan to be registered with the DNR. So then that way we're very, because your acres that are eligible for SFIA are based off of the original acreage in that, in that Forest Management Plan. And so that's kind of where that comes into a play. And there's also going to be a new monitoring program, which I'll touch on briefly later. Uh, and DNR would also be responsible for um, some monitoring that will go with the program. So it, it's a little, it, it can be confusing with two different agencies. So hopefully um, you, you can see kind of the breakdown there so you know who to contact based on what your question is. Uh, another one of the changes here down below, and this was a welcome change, is you may withdraw early without penalty if you require a permanent conservation easement that is at least as restrictive as your covenant in SFIA. So this would be for if you were, let's say you're in SFIA and you get approached by a Minnesota Land Trust or other conservation easement organization, or you're just interested in, in acquiring a conservation easement on your property. Well, previously you couldn't get out of the covenant because remember there's that four year countdown period, assuming you've already met eight years. And so that, that, was, that caused a roadblock in acquiring that conservation easement. And it kind of goes against the intent of the law is to protect lands and conservation easements are usually more restrictive than the covenant is because they often go on forever. So if that's if you're in that case, what you would do essentially was provide go through the conservation easement process first. Once the easements in place, you uh, provide documentation to the Department of Revenue and then that covenant will be immediately released. So you would, it has to be done first. You couldn't um, say, well, I'm planning on getting a conservation easement, can I withdraw from SFIA? It wouldn't work. You'd actually have to have that easement in place. So that's effective immediately um, as soon as the law passed in 2017. And you now have three covenant length options. So previously it was only eight years. Now you also have a 20 year and a 50 year option. And your payments are gonna increase along with the length of the covenant. I'll show you the payment rates here on the next slide. And another change is how that payment's calculated. So previously, it was in statute that the payment was $7 per acre. So regardless of what land values were, your payment was $7 per SFIA acre. Well, now these, this is 
um, complicated based on the, on the market value of 2C lands. So 2C is the other tax program, the tax program called 2C Managed Forest Land. So essentially, if you took all the, the land across the state of Minnesota that's enrolled in 2C, revenue is figuring out an average market value of all that land. And then that goes into a formula that takes into account township tax levies. I don't completely understand exactly how it works, but essentially just know that it, it, it'll go up and down based on the market value of land that is in 2C, which makes, which makes sense. That's calculated every year. So they'll come up with these payment rates and then the payment cannot change by more than 10% from year to year. So let's just say the payment this year is $10. Revenue calculates the, the new payment rate to be $15. Well, your payment can't go up by more than 10%, so then your payment would be $11. And vice versa, if, the, if uh, land values were to drop, the calculated payment goes down. The same, same scenario, your payment can't go down the next year by more than $1. 10% of $10. So that's kind of how that 10% uh, change works. So let's look at the, uh, the payments here. This is the exact same table that was in the letter that went out to current enrollees. So for eight year, in bold, you can see the payment rate. And this is estimated on 2017 numbers, I believe. So these aren't, I believe they're not the official rates yet. Uh, it's $8.91. And if you go up to the 20 year, it's going to be $12.33, and if you go up to the 50-year, it's $15.76. So you can see those payments have taken um, a bit of a jump. And you also notice there's another payment rate option there if you have more than 1,920 acres enrolled. And so that is there, and, the, and you might be wondering why that is. So that essentially was there, from my understanding, is, is if, if, you, if you enroll more than 1,920 acres, you have to allow public access. Again, that's always been a part of the law. Well, now those landowners are going to be compensated for that, essentially, is, is my understanding of how it works. Um, so that's why there's the two different payment rates there. And another thing to note here down at the bottom is if you're a current enrollee, if you received, which in this case, if you received a payment in 2017 or before, your payment can moving forward cannot go below seven dollars per acre so that's written in the law so if for some reason land values dropped far enough and the calculated payment was below seven dollars you would stay at the seven dollar rate all new enrollees would move towards that new rate if that that if that were the scenario probably not very likely but it's possible john we have a question from online about those okay. um lands that are required to be open um does that include foot traffic, motorized access, and hunting? And if so, what is the liability to the landowner? Mm. Good question. So I, I believe it's written. It's written in the law. So the question was, you know, what's the, what's the liability to the landowner for those lands that are open to public access, and what type of access? And I believe it says for for hunting and fishing access or, or something like that. So I'd have to, the motorized, I don't know off the top of my head, I'd have to clarify that for you. Um, and the liability is a good question that I don't have the answer to. So that one I'm not gonna be able to answer, um, at least right now. There's another question if you'd sure. like to take yep. one, um, kind of related to counties. Um, does the covenant impact how a county would administer its local zoning ordinances? Uh, for example, can a county issue a permit for a home on a property with an SFIA covenant? Um, good question. I, my thought is, so counties do things a little bit differently, so it's it would be tough to make a, a statement that would apply to all counties. My thought is that if land that is bound by the covenant, so that, that land is identified, the SFI land that's bound by the covenant should be documented. And I would think that the county would not issue a, any permits to be built on that SFI land if they were aware of it. Now, it wouldn't affect the, the so if a parcel is half an SFI and half isn't, you could still get a building permit on the other half, and that would be no issue. Not sure if that's exactly what the question was referring to, but um, I, you would think the county would notice that, and they would they would they would not allow a building permit. But I can't say for sure. Okay.
Okay, moving forward. I see I'm going for about 35 minutes here, so we'll kind of speed it up here a little bit to get to 40 minutes. Um, it's going to keep the requirement that, so you can have a conservation easement and be an SFIA. So we're talking about the public access requirements for that. And even moving forward, you could, if you had an easement that met uh, certain parameters, and one of them is it has to be dated before May 30th of 2013, certain easements are eligible. And if you would uh, enroll in SFIA, your payment in 2000, um, that should be uh, 2018, your payment would be $3.43. So there's a lower payment rate for those that are um, new enrollees in SFIA with a conservation easement. I don't know how many people out there would exist in this situation, but it is an option. And the reason I put that at $7 payment in there, so if you received a, a payment last year and have a conservation easement, your, even though the payment rate is $3.43, if you have an easement and SFIA, um, you're capped at that, you get that $7 floor, so then your payment would be $7, and you only have an option for an eight-year covenant. And so I just have a note at the bottom there, so easements that are rim reserve, aren't, you cannot be an SFIA regardless of, of dates. So there's, there's a, some more information on what types of easements are not eligible. And so check out the website, our DNR SFIA website, for more information on that if you have any questions. So penalties are one of the recommendations by the auditor. And so there are stricter penalties now for covenant violations. So if you build a structure on SFIA land, so you would pay back payments plus interest. And I believe that's what the, the penalty was before. However, now, in addition to that, you would be responsible for 25% um, of the new estimated market value of that parcel based on that structure being built. So you could see that some of those uh, violations, you know, could, could be pretty significant depending on what kind of structure was built. And then if you change land use, it's a similar case, um, but it's 30% of the new estimated market value based on the new land use um, on top of those back payments. So uh, keep those in mind. And so again, the, these are strict. And the way, the way I, I kind of look at this is the state's investing a lot of money in this SFIA program. So if you take a million acres and multiply it, you know, by some of those numbers, you can see the amount of money the states invest in. So I, I, I can see how this came into play and why they wanted to make sure that though their investment was, was meeting the purpose of what the original law was. And so, um, one of the recommendations was is to increase penalties. And so, so here are the penalties that were that were written in the law. We have a couple more questions about payments. Can okay. You take those? Yeah, you bet. Okay. Uh, the first is: Is there a maximum payment cap on the annual payment? There is no, uh, the question was, is there a, a cap on max payments? And there is not. Okay. The second is, if a current enrollee receives the $7 payment in 2017, will 2018 payment be limited to a 10% increase or will it be the newly established 891? Good question. So the question was, is uh, next, so in 2018, will the payment rate go up by 10% or will it go up to the new calculated rate? So the answer to that is everybody's going to go up to the new calculated rate. So the 10% rule does not apply during this transition, but it will apply moving forward. Okay, so a couple more changes here to touch on. So uh, change of ownership. So if you sell land that's SFIA, that has SFIA on it, again, that covenant is still bound to that land. So the new landowner would have to follow that or abide by that covenant. And so as a landowner, you should, you're supposed to notify the landowner before the sale about that that SFI covenant exists. And then you must notify the Department of Revenue in writing of the new landowner within 60 days of the title transfer. And then Department of Revenue can follow up with that new landowner uh, for information on how they um, would enroll in SFI and give them more information on the law. So that was uh, not a lot of changes there, but the, that 60-day notification was definitely one that was put in there. And I mentioned a monitoring program. So before that was one of the recommendations from the auditor was there was very little program oversight. It was kind of self-compliance. And so now DNR, so this is going to start in July 1 of 2019. So 10% of all claimants of each year will be monitored annually. And the whole, and so DNR is going to do that monitoring. And then we report the results to the Department of Revenue. And it may require a site visit. 
doesn't necessarily have to always involve a site visit. And so that whole process and, and how we're going to do that still to be determined. Um, but I just want to mention that that is, you know, a fairly significant change, you know, to the program that th there'll be active monitoring happening every year starting uh, in 2019. So that's the changes. So I've touched on, I, that, I highlighted some of the major changes. So now I'm just going to kind of go into you know, how does that affect you and what do you need to do based on these new changes? So some of this stuff is from the letter that was recently set out, sent out to current enrollees. So what do you need, if you're a current enrollee, you know, what do you need to do based on these changes? So if you're a current enrollee, who that is, is that somebody, you submitted your application and were accepted to SFI for, for uh, the Department of Revenue for SFI before September 30th of the last year, 2017. So that's considered a current enrollee. So you, you don't have to do anything, new actions, and I underline new because, you know, you would still want to make sure your plan is up to date. You know, there's some things you'd still be aware of. However, new actions based on the law, you wouldn't have to do anything. If all three of these uh, bullets are true, if your forest management plan is current and registered with the DNR, if you would like to stay at an eight-year covenant length, and you don't have a conservation easement that overlaps with your SFIA land, that's the case. All three of those are true. Um, there's no action you need to take. So you just wait for the next correspondence from Department of Revenue um, with a certification letter and um, just follow the directions on there. Um, if that's not the case, what you need to decide is if you want to go to a 20 or a 50 year covenant length. And you have that option and you have to make that decision by July 1 of 2018 if you want to do that payment this year. However, you don't have to do it this year. You can stay at the eight year. And May 15th of 2019 is your deadline to make that decision permanently. So you're not gonna be able to change your covenant length. This is current enrollees. You're not gonna be able to change your covenant length after May 15th of 2019. So, and then you'll be required to follow the minimum enrollment length of each of those covenants, whatever you choose. And if you choose, if you don't choose anything, you'll just stay at that eight-year covenant. So you don't necessarily have to notify if you want to stay an eight-year, which is default to that date. But if you want to go longer, you definitely want to make that decision by no later than May 15th and 19. And the other question is, as well, the other thing to do is, is you need to verify that your forest management plan is registered. So if you're 100% sure you, you have that letter, your plan is current, you should be okay. If you're unsure, you can email uh, DNR and ask if your plan is registered and we'll look it up for you. And there's the email address, that SFIA.DNR. It's also on our website. It was also on the letter that came out. And if it's not registered, you'll need to get that plan to us. And again, you have until May 15th of 2019 to do that. And Preferably, you can email that plan to that email address. If you can't email it, you can mail paper copies to that to the address listed there. And again, there's more in-depth information on this on the website. What if you can't find your forest management plan? So what I would do there was, is, is if you know who the forester who wrote the plan was, contact that person. And if you can get a hold of them, ask them if they can send it to you. Um, a lot of them have it in electronic format and most of them would be willing to work with you and just send that to you. So if you know who that person is, um, that would be uh, something that tries to contact them. If you don't know who wrote your plan, which may be the case also, you can email the SFIA email address, email us. And before I was saying, remember that cover page is at Department of Revenue of your plan. So we can, we'll find that cover page and look up the plan writer and we'll email or call you back and let you know who that is. And if we have updated contact information, whatever we know, we'll definitely pass that on to you. If you're still unable to locate the plan, um, then you would have to get, and it's not registered um, already, you'll have to contact a, a forester to get a new one prepared. Because again, there's a new requirements that are going to go effect in 2019. And so you'll have May 15th to submit that new plan to the DNR. And so if that's your scenario, you would want to, you'd look up a, 
you would go to the My Minnesota Woods website. The approved DNR plan writers are listed there. You would contact one of those plan writers to write your plan for you. And you wouldn't want to wait to do that. Sometimes it can take several months for a forester to get to your property. So if, if that is your scenario, you definitely don't put that off until 2019. You want to act on that sooner. And so now I'm just going to run through a quick highlight of just some dates for current enrollees and future enrollees. Um, how are we doing on time? I see we're at, we're at 45 minutes right now. Yeah, and there's a bunch of questions. Bunch of questions. Right? Okay, <laughs> so a lot of this this information here is just repeated, which I'm gonna um, go through here. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna quickly skim through this. Know that this information will be available um, online in a PDF format, so you'll be able to go back and reference this information. And so this is just kind of timelines. If you're if you're uh, Current enrollee, it kind of puts there in writing and puts it in a different format to see um, how these dates would affect you. And again, I did it for 2019 for uh, current enrollees. And again, the, the key date there is that May 15 date. If you want to change your covenant length or it's also the deadline to submit your management plan. How does this affect you if you're a new enrollee? Well, right up front, you're going to choose if, what covenant length you want to do. And right up front, you know, your plan must be registered. So that's something you'll, you'll want to do that, provide that groundwork before you submit your application. And the new application deadline's been moved back from it. Last year, it was September 30th. Now it's going to be October 31st. So that being the case, your, you, your plan should be submitted for registration 45 days before that, which is September 15th. I thought I had that on here somewhere. Yeah, here it is. So for new enrollees, again, new enrollees, your, your deadline is September 15th to submit your plan for registration, and your application deadline is October 31st, which also you must have your covenant recorded at the county's assessor's office. Those covenant forms and the new application are on the Department of Revenue's website. I'll show you a link to that here shortly. And again, contact your plan writer, writer well in advance. And 2019, this is just what the annual uh, schedule would look like. So uh, payments are still going out October 1st. So I'm just going to skip through here. If you're, if you're a plan writer, how does this affect you? Well, you might be getting requests from your uh, landowners asking you for their plan. But just note that it, it is their responsibility to send it in. So in this case, we're asking them to send it in. Um, but if you want to send it in for them, great. You know what, that's up to you. Um, and obviously, you'll have more plans to register moving forward, and I can imagine you'll get more plan requests moving forward because with the higher payment rate options now with SFI, I could see some more interest in the program. And so for more information, that was a kind of a lot of stuff I went through today. There's a lot more. Um, so if you got information on applying for SFI, if you have questions on covenants or payments, um, go to the Department of Revenue's website as shown here and type SFIA into the search box or you can, or email that email address as shown if you have questions and for land eligibility forest management plans or easements contact go to the DNR um, SFIA web page and, and type in uh, SFIA in the search box if you go to that address as shown or email the SFIA email address with questions so um, again definitely go check that out because there is some more information if questions aren't getting answered on those web pages, um, let me know or, or email that SFI email and, and mention you know what that may be so we can get you know some useful information up there. So um, yeah, I guess I, I ran through some of that kind of quick. So now we can take some time for questions. Um, yeah, and just a, a quick note before we get into questions, uh, I've got that it's about twelve fifty. We will stay around to try to answer all the questions that come in as long as John is willing to stay with us. So uh, we may run over a little over one o'clock, but um, if you do need to skip out, that that's fine too. Um, Emily has some questions, I believe. We have a laundry list for you. Wow, I'll do okay. my best. So the first question is: If a landowner dies, the surviving spouse can unenroll. Uh, if done within one year, does this pertain to a family corporation? So, okay, so the question was if somebody, if the, if the enrollee dies, mm -hmm. can you repeat the second part there with the corporation? Does this pertain to a family corporation? Does it pertain to a family corporation? So one thing I, I did not mention, which is a, it's good this question was brought up, is there's a, there's a death clause. 
So what that says is if, if you're an enrollee and you pass away, um, the new one, the covenant could be released from that from that land. Don't know exactly how that process would work because it hasn't happened yet. So, but know that 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 is in the law, and I don't know the distinction. To, so, the, if there's a distinction with uh, corporation, was it corp? That last part was corporate. I don't know if it meant. I guess the short answer is, is I don't know. I suspect that. Um, that's a good, so can you ask that question one more time? I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, so if the landowner dies, um, does this pertain to a family corporate, does unenrolling pertain to a family corporation, the rules, the so that, so that would maybe. Uh, so that would maybe, be, if I understand that question, if you have a family corporation, you maybe have multiple people listed as the landowner, and if one person dies, are they still able to withdraw? If that's the question, is that, if that's the question, that my answer would be, I'm not sure exactly. So that would be something to uh, that we would need to clarify. Okay. What happens if land is given to family members after a current owner's death? Can land be withdrawn and re-entered with building sites left out? Um, so if, if uh, somebody passed away mm -hmm. with the death clause, the question is if they unenrolled, could they unenroll and then re-enroll with, with smaller acreage mm -hmm. due to buildings? Is that right? Uh, re-entered with the building sites left out. Yeah. So usually when you unenroll, it's all or nothing, and then you have to wait three years before you re-enroll. So with this death clause, off the top of my head, I'm not sure if you have to wait out that three-year period. You might. Um, so that would be something Department of Revenue would, would have to clarify. But uh, I, you could withdraw and then re-enroll, but you may have to, to wait that three years before you do it. That would be the, the part I don't know. Okay. Did you, is this Yeah, I've got related? several questions as well. But, um, I can stay later too. Um, so my understanding is that if the land is currently enrolled to C, it needs to be unenrolled prior to being enrolled in SFIA, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. So the, the question was, if you have land in 2C, do you have to unenroll that before you go into SFIA? And yes, you can't. So if you have a parcel that has any 2C land, that parcel's ineligible for SFIA. Yep. And, and so my actual follow-up question to that is, so um, for this current upcoming tax year then, is it okay to make the 2018 tax payment at 2C rate and then, you know, understanding that those could be prepaid in advance of the enrollment in SFIA this year and then unenrolled after that. So that. So you're, I think are you, you're asking if, you're, you're asking about timing of application. So you're, are you wondering, so the scenario would be you're in 2C and when would you apply, when would you look to apply in SFIA? In fall of 2018. In fall of 2018. And so, yeah, so you wouldn't, you wouldn't get your SFI payment until 2019. And so you wouldn't be receiving that double benefit in 18. Um, that's a unique scenario. I don't know exactly how revenue would, if, if they would still allow you to be in there if they saw 2C was on the land during enrollment time. So you'd obviously say your intent was that you're going to unenroll that. But I'm not sure if you actually have to unenroll it first before your application is accepted or not. Um, so that would be a question. Yeah, we'd have to direct to revenue. Do you, do you know what the actual um, process is for unenrolling from 2C? Is that just a call to the assessor? Is so yeah, two, the withdrawal process for 2C and every county assessor might handle it a little bit differently. But it's an annual program, so they may already. They probably automatically assume you want to re-enroll, so you would just, you know, I would call them today, or, you know, when it's to say your intent that you want to withdraw. Um, so the, the application deadline is May 1st for 2C, so that would be, you know, before that would be the time you'd want to notify them um, that you're looking to get out, but definitely sooner, you know, the better, you know, just in case there's something odd there. Yeah, question. Can I go ahead? Oh, in your monitoring program, 10% each year, is that 10% random each year, or is it once you get monitored, it'll be another 10 years till you're chosen again? 
Yeah, so the question was how a 10% monitoring, will you, essentially, how do you determine that 10%? Could you get, could you get in, uh, monitored twice within a 10-year period? Um, so it's 10% 10, 10 of current enrollees every year. And so we have flexibility how we determine that 10%. And the, 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 so the answer, we don't know for sure. So I, it is possible you could get monitored twice. If there was a reason um, why we wanted to monitor, maybe we noticed something on a photo, or, or maybe uh, there could be a variety of other reasons why maybe we'd want to monitor it. So. It, to answer your question, I don't know for sure, but there's nothing saying that we wouldn't monitor somebody more than once um, in a certain period of time. So it's possible, but to be determined. And when your uh, stewardship plan expires, how much time do you have to get a new plan established with your consulting forester? Okay, so the question was, your stewardship plan expires, how much time do you have to get that plan established with your consulting forester? So the, you know, so we're in this transition provision now. So if you're a current enrollee, you have that until that May 15th date. But moving forward, let's say, let's get rid of the transition provision. Let's say we're two years from now. So how it's gonna work now is your, Certification letters are due on July 1st to De Department of Revenue. So every year they mail out a certification letter to all enrollees. And that's essentially um, saying that, you know, you do that current enrollees get that letter now. And once revenue gets that back, it's essentially saying that you're, you're still meeting program requirements. You'll get your payment this year. So that would be the deadline. So July 1 of whatever year your plan expires. Now let me rephrase that. So if you're Let's say, for example, your plan expires in 2019. Okay, so your plan expired in 2019. You would have to update that plan by July 1 that year if it expired before July 1 of 2019. If it ex expired the second half of 2019, you would have July 1 of the next year to update the plan. So it's kind of confusing, but July 1 is the deadline date to get that plan updated. Um, based on when your plan expires, it's, um, I, I can see how can kind of confusing right now without maybe putting up a graphic on how that works. But you would want to notify, so we'll be sending out letters, you know, a year in advance when your plan expires. And so that would be the time to contact your plan writer a year in advance. Um, and you could update it anytime you want. If you wanted, you could update it before 10 years and put it in place. If you chose to, you could do that, um, but you wouldn't have to until your plan expired, and then based on what date your plan expires, will dictate you know when you'll have to, to update it for the next deadline, certification deadline. When you get a new stewardship plan, the plan has to be mailed to the DNR and the title page, what have you, have to be sent to the DOR, right? Both have to be. Contacted. So okay. So the question is, you get a new plan written or updated. Do you have to send the full plan to the DNR and then also the cover page and the map to the revenue is, so you do not have to send anything to revenue now with your forest management plan. So we're in communicate, we'll be in communication with revenue. We'll send them a list that says, hey, these are all the enrollees that have a current registered man forest management plan, much like how we do with 2C and the county assessors. And so you would, uh, if you're getting a new plan or updated plan, like I was saying before, your plan writer would just they would be the ones that would be getting the plan uh, to the DNR. So that's that's kind of how our process works. They email the plan to the DNR forester. They'll do it, and then the, they review. There's a back and forth review process, and then when the plan is complete, then it's okay to deliver that plan to you, the landowner. And then to get it registered, there'd be a fifty dollar payment. So you you would get sent to an invoice for fifty dollars, and once that invoice is received, then you're officially registered. So that's and then you would get a a registration letter confirming that. Um, so in this transition, you're being asked to send that plan in yourself if you're a current enrollee. New enrollees and everything moving forward once we get out of this transition, most of the time this is this will be taken care of by your plan writer at least getting the plan to the DNR. Okay, uh, the next online question is, can someone withdraw three acres for a building site if changing the length of the covenant before July 2019? 
Good question. So that's some uh, question was, should I be repeating the questions when you ask them too? Okay. So the question was, is if you, um, if you're changing covenant length, can you essentially, can you change the amount of acres of enrollment? Could you subtract three acres for a building site and then change to a 20 year covenant length? That's a good, good question. I'm glad this one is asked. I probably should have put that in the presentation. You cannot change your acres of enrollment. And so um, this isn't an opportunity to um, move acres around for SFIA. Um, the only time you can withdraw acres is if you meet that conservation easement that overlaps with your SFIA land. So those, the, the small number of landowners where that's the case, they can take out only those acres that are affected by that. Everyone else, you cannot, you can't, can't alter your acres at all. So you can't um, move one acre here and move one acre over there. It has to be the exact same acres as you currently have enrolled. So the answer is no, you could not um, subtract those acres. Okay. Uh, is there a penalty for plans that are outdated or expired? There is, no, there's currently no penalty for that. Um, but essentially what that means is, oh, I'm sorry, so the question was, is there a penalty for if your plan is expired? There is no penalty if your plan is expired. However, if it is expired, so if it's past 10 years, you're not in compliance, and then you just would not receive your SFIA payment. Um, so again, you're still bound by the covenant. So you're, you cannot, you know, develop your land or alter it um, against the restrictions of the covenant, but you would just stop receiving a payment because your plan expired. And whenever you did update your plan, then your payments would start up again. Do penalty funds go back into the overall program funds, like a rollover account in the state budget? Uh, I don't think, I haven't seen that written in statute anyway. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> okay. Um, can out of state notaries notarize the covenants? Uh, good question. That's one I, the, the question is can out of state uh notaries notarize covenants that would be a question for your county assessor i do not know the answer to that one okay this is a pretty detailed one my woodland stewardship plan breaks down my acreage into stewardship acres sfia tax acres and 2c forest tax acres when i look at my property tax statement i just see a property tax classification of managed forest land nothing about sfia or 2c forest tax acres I haven't received any SFIA payments, and I have a letter from the DNR with a registration number for my stewardship plan. Should I contact Revenue and or DNR to find out if I should be getting SFIA payments? Okay, so the, the question was a scenario. It sounds like somebody who has, they have a woodland stewardship plan that's registered. Sounds like they're a part of the 2C Managed Forest Program. It's showing up on their tax, so they're being taxed at a reduced rate on their acres. Should they contact Department of Revenue to receive SFIA payments. If, if I'm understanding the question, it sounds like that the person is in 2C, which, and if you're in 2C, you are you cannot be enrolled in SFIA also for those same acres. So if you think you're an SFIA, um, I would verify that and contact the Department of Revenue. Otherwise, I'm making the assumption that you probably are not an SFI, if I understand your question right, because you're in 2C. Could they have separate parcels in, in both one of each? Both yeah, programs? so um, the comment was, or the question, can you have separate parcels in both programs? Yes, you could. You just can't have both programs on the same tax parcel. So you could have 40 acres in SFIA over here on your property. You could have 40 acres over there in a 2C on your property, that's completely okay. It just can't overlap on the same parcel. So if you wanted to get an SFIA with a, with a parcel that's currently being taxed at the 2C rate, you would have to um, notify the county assessor withdraw from 2C um, before you get an SFIA. And that kind of went back to our question earlier. Um, and, there, and I'm not sure the exact timing how that would work exactly, but that's what you would need to do. Okay, and then under SFIA, can you have different parcels under different covenant lengths? Another great question. The question was, in SFIA, can you have different parcels under different covenant lengths? And yes, you can. So you can have, um, so the restrictions are you can have one covenant length per parcel. So you can't split it, when we say parcel, meaning a tax parcel. So it has, it's signed a tax parcel pin ID number. 
So each one of your parcels could have, if you have SFI land that's scattered on different parcels, you could choose different covenant lengths, um, and which would be a different payment for different parcels that are enrolled. So yes, you can do that. Okay. Is there a four-year notification period for the longer 20 and 50-year contracts, like the existing covenant, or do they just end, and will there be any notification to renew? So the question was, is uh, for the new covenant lengths of 20 and 50 years, is there a four, is it still a four-year notification requirement? And actually, I thought I'd put this in my presentation, but I'm glad this question came up. It is different. So it's half of the covenant length is the, is the required notification period for uh, SFI. So for example, so it's previously, previously it's been eight years covenant. So half of the covenant length is four years. If you choose a 20 year, now half of that covenant length is 10 years. So if, if you want to get out of SFI 8, at year 20, you would provide notification at year 10. If you want to get uh, out of SFIA at year 25, you would provide notification at year 15. So you, there, there, and, and for 50 year, it would be 25 years. That's half the length. And the second part, would it be, is there an automatic, what was the second, if it's automatically? Uh, uh, will there be any notification to renew? Um, that, that uh, so it, it, you automatically renew, so remember covenants never end. So you're never going to be asked if you want to renew. I shouldn't say never, um, but you you have to initiate that withdrawal process if you want to um, withdraw from SFI. Otherwise, um, that you're you're just it's assumed that you're just going to continue to stay in the program. Is there an affirmative obligation to um, manage the property then, when, according to the? Forest management plan, and is that part of the monitoring process? So the question was, is is it um, is it required to follow? So there is a requirement in the law, and it's been there's no change that you must follow your forest management plan. So essentially, is that going to be a part of the monitoring process? And I, I would suspect, yeah. I mean, that would be an opportunity for us to to look at the plan with the landowner and say, you know, hey, it looks, you know, are, are you following your plan? Um, Right now, there, there's no intent to, if you're not, um, the question on, well, what is, so this kind of gets into, well, what is following a, a management plan? And that can mean a lot of different things to a lot of people. There's a lot of, um, you know, you know, some people may have 40 acres that was uh, clear cut Aspen, you know, 30 years ago, and there's, there's hardly anything you can do. So there, there's no, uh, this isn't, it's not, it's not uh, as formal teeth in it kind of like the, the Wisconsin's version of the managed forest land law over there where if, if someone put a harvest in there you'd have to harvest on that year and if, um, if you didn't there was there was you know big consequences that program set up differently the incentives are quite a bit higher so they put that in there so with SFIA there, there's not that um, amount of teeth in it at this point um, but that being said it is in the law that you must follow your plan so that would be an opportunity um, during that monitoring is to talk with the landowner about their plan and ask them, you know, you know, what have you done, you know, in the last, uh, since you've been enrolled and kind of have that conversation, but there's, there's no, there's been no definitive um, process exactly how that'll be done quite yet. Okay. Um, a landowner is wondering, uh, is interested in having a conservation easement on 100 acres. Would he be able to do both? And um, would he be able to do that along with SFIA? And, uh, but he would just, sorry, it's kind of worded funny. He would still have to allow public access. Is that correct? Yeah, so the question is, is somebody, so the scenario is somebody's currently in SFIA, and if they wanted to get a conservation easement on their land, would they... Uh, have to allow public access yes. and so the answer is if you if your enrolled portion of your SFI land is under that 1920 acres then yes you would have to allow public access but not all conservation easements are eligible so the, the first thing to look at would be if it's a new conservation easement you automatically would not be eligible because in statute it has this date to May 30th 2013 I don't know the exact history of why that is the case so your easement would have to be dated before, um, it would have to be dated May 30th, 2013 or before. 
in order for that easement to be eligible to be also enrolled in SFIA. And then it can't, there's certain types of easements that could not be. It can't be one that's a, a REM, a reserve easement. So those type of easements, regardless of date, are not eligible for SFIA. So there's a couple of those uh, questions to figure out. Um, but if, if it is an eligible easement, um, you could enroll, you would get that lower payment rate of $3 and, and was it 40 something cents, and then you would have to allow public access on those acres only. Okay. Uh, a comment and question. The whole point of the four year wait was to assure that the land protection did not fail during the three most statistically vulnerable points of death, disease, or divorce. So why did this change get made? Is this also true for the 20 and 50 year programs? If so, nearly every 50 year, year program could be ended before the 50 years were up. So yeah, so, so this one, <clears throat> I think this question is asking what a question we may have already hit on. I think it's at the question is asking if, if you have a 50 year covenant, it's essentially this question to you is if it's a 50 year covenant, is the withdrawal period still four years? Is that? That's that's kind of the way how I read it. And so the answer is no. The withdrawal period would be 25 years if it's a 50-year covenant. And um, I don't know exactly why, but the way I kind of look at it is maybe you know the state wants to make sure that you know they're paying a higher dollar amount, so they want to make sure they're getting um, that investment of protection. And so that's why um, they they have a higher withdrawal period as opposed to the lower payments of eight years. So. Just, just speculation. I'm not sure exactly, but I th think that answers that question. If, if there's any issues with the application, is there an opportunity to to correct those within uh, this application period? Uh, so the question is, if there's any issues with the application, um, is there opportunity to fix that during the application period? So what would be uh, an example of? Uh, oh, I don't even know. Like um, like a new enrollee, would you right, say? Yeah, a new so if there was an issue, it would hopefully it would be caught before everything was. So maybe it would depend on what what uh, the issue is. Um, so I don't know if you have any other specifics that maybe would help. Yeah, I mean, I guess I don't really have a specific example other than you know if there was something that was. Flagged as oh, this doesn't look right on your application that you submitted. You just have an opportunity to go back and fix that. I see. So let's let's say a land someone went and recorded a covenant and identified, you know, what acres they want to enroll, and, and maybe then it comes to the DNR. We look at it, and we determine. Well, I don't know if if if, if those acres are quite eligible, or so, so there still is an opportunity for back and forth. So if, if if we see issues with acres and roll, we would definitely contact a landowner, um, and then we would work we would work some of these enroll uh, acres uh, issues out before the application was you know in stone with the Department of Revenue. So there would be an opportunity to have some back and forth on on applications. Yeah. Okay. I think we've got five more right now. Um, so if there is a sudden death with a 50 year covenant, can the spouse unenroll? So if there's a the question, if there's a sudden death with a 50 year covenant, can the spouse unenroll? So the way that clause is written is it, it doesn't single out any covenant length. So, so yeah, as long as that, if that person met, met that, uh, clause requirement, it wouldn't matter what the covenant length is to unenroll, uh, from the program if there was a death. Okay, and um, if a landowner wants to exit a covenant agreement, is it a simple written request or are there requirements that must be met to honor it? Sure, so um, the minimum requirement, so the question was if you wanted to withdraw a covenant, what is essentially what is the process to do so and what are the requirements? So the baseline requirement is, is you have to meet the minimum covenant length so once you've met that minimum covenant length period, um, all you do is provide a written request to Department of Revenue. So and then they they would just they would just release the covenant. There's no uh, logistically it doesn't take four years. Logistically it doesn't take ten years. Um, it's just a program requirement. So 
if you wanted to, again, if you wanted to withdraw at year eight, you would provide that written notification at year four or, or, or whatever date you decide you want to get out in four years, as long as it's past the minimum covenant length period, um, that covenant would be released after you met half of the uh, covenant length. If that makes sense. Are 501c charitable organizations bound by the identified buyer covenant restrictions if land is donated? Okay, read that one one more time. Are 501c charitable organizations bound by the identified buyer covenant restrictions if that land is donated? So uh, the question was if a 5013c, if a nonprofit organization purchases land with an SFI covenant, are they bound? By that, the restrictions or of the it's covenant. donated to them that's bound by that covenant. Yeah. Um, so there's something in there for like government agencies. I, I believe they would still be bound by the covenant. Um, there, there's in there like if, uh, for example, if, if uh, state government DNR purchased land, that covenant would be released. Um, but I, I so I, I think uh, the five of a nonprofit would still have to be bound by the covenant. Not 100% sure, but that's that's what my feeling is. Okay. Uh, the questions about the death release clause, which provides a golden opportunity to invalidate an easement, um, especially with the 50 year easements, very few landowners are going to live out that full term. So, what's the point of a 50 year easement with a death clause? So, yeah, the question was what's the point of a 50 year? So the, the question was easement, so what, what's a covenant? So e easement would be different. So a 50-year covenant, what's the point if very few people, you know, they'll live beyond that 50 years, they can just get out of it, what's the point of it? Um, I guess it's, uh, it just comes down to maybe opinion, so maybe I'll, I, I don't know if I can provide a good answer for that. Okay. Because I don't, I don't know the intent of, I don't know full intent of a lot of the rules that are in the law, so it would just be kind of my opinion. And on that one, I guess I don't have too strong of an opinion either. So. Um, can you lease land for hunting? If it's less than the 1920 acres? The question is, can you lease land for hunting if you're in SFIA and you have under 1,920 acres? Um, yes, you could. Yeah. And then the last question we have from online, I think, is what's the reasoning behind allowing public access on land with conservation easements? Good question. I wish I knew the answer. Um, I don't know. I don't know exactly uh, what the reasoning is. Um, I've wondered that myself exactly, kind of why that is in there. What, I, what I've heard is that there was no outright attempt to open up SFI lands for public access because um, if it was if the intent was to open up private land for public access statewide using SFIA we all know that everyone had unenrolled um, and as you heard the intent of the law when we went at the beginning was you know to encourage sustainable forestry and also to protect that land from development to keep forest land forest so I don't know exactly why that's the case, um, but it is in there. So, um, and I don't know if I can get that answer, to be honest with you. I don't know who I would ask, because <laughs> uh, some I know some some uh, folks at Revenue maybe don't know the, the answer also on some of these, uh, how things ended up in the law. So um, the short answer is, I don't know. We have one more question that came in. Okay. It's okay. You bet. Uh, how can I tell if it is more beneficial financially to be in 2C or SFIA? The question is, how can you tell if it's uh, more beneficial financially if you're enrolled in 2C or SFIA? So you would, so the short answer is, is hire a tax uh, professional. But one thing you're, kind of what you'll be looking at is what is your, how much is your land being taxed and you're that you're thinking of enrolling so because the 2c tax classification will reduce your taxes by 35 percent so you'll kind of be looking at the math of okay so if my land is being reduced at 35 percent in taxes what dollar amount is that and then if you take into account how many acres would be an sfia at eight dollars and 91 cents for example what is that dollar amount 
um, you can compare them. Now, another important point when you're doing that comparison, SFIA payments are taxable income. So the payment's 891, but then that would be taxed, and that's all based on um, your income. So there's no straightforward or easy answer to that question. Um, but that's um, kind of how you would start to look at that. There's a lot of nuance. Thanks for sticking around. To there is. There's. <laughs> Yes, thank you, John. So many, many questions. Um, I think you set the SFBC UMN Extension 40 webinar record for the most number of questions. <laughs> so for that, we thank you. And thanks to Emily Downbeck for handling all those that were coming in online. Um, you should have seen um, CEU credits, um, a form uh, that Madison Rodman would have sent out. Um, and we're going to follow up um, with um, uh, an email uh, with a lot of the links that John mentioned and a copy of his slides with the recording as well. Um, and yeah, I really encourage you to um, to check out this um, this email address that John has too, with specific questions um, about your case. Um, and so, uh, if there is enough interest, you know, we'll talk um, uh, among others here um, about potentially doing something else, kind of a Q and A session. It seems like there's clearly a lot of interest and still a lot of questions about the new SFI. Absolutely, so, yeah, definitely. Um, so thank you, John. Uh, we'll sign off from here, uh, and do join us next month, uh, February twentieth, um, is next month's webinar. Uh, so thanks for joining.